And before I dive in, I just want, I should say, I'm Beth Harris. I'm the executive director of Smart History. And um, what follows is not legal advice. None of us are lawyers at Smart History, but over the years we've learned a lot and I'm looking forward to sharing what we've learned with you. And what I did in arranging this uh, talk was to um, try to think about how I wish someone had explained these things to me when I was, um, when I was just starting out with Smart history. So I hope I lay things out really clearly for you. And this is just a reminder of the conversations that are coming up that you can register for. So most obviously, when we think about images that we can use, we have two categories, right? We have copyright and we have things in the public domain and works move from, the, from being copyrighted into the public domain. Currently, that takes 96 years after the creation of the work of art. Uh, it used to be a shorter time. But the idea was not so much when, they, when the founders wrote the copyright law, wasn't so much to protect the rights of the copyright holder. It was actually to make sure that works, creations entered the public domain where they could be used freely, where, you know, the idea was that if we had this pool of, of things in the public domain that we could draw, all draw from, that we could be more creative, we could have a, a, a sort of brighter future. And so uh, the public domain is, is super important that it exists. And um, every year new things to enter the public domain. And there are a bunch of websites that chronicle what enters the public domain every year, including this from uh, Duke Law School. They have a center for the study of the public domain. And so uh, the public domain copyright exists to make sure that we can all, in a way, inherit the great wealth of knowledge and inventions and creativities of everyone who came before us to create new things. So copyright is um, a pretty straightforward concept, but there is one area in which it affects those of us studying images um, in, in a very direct way. And so I wanna actually start by talking about something called copyright overreach. So basically someone can take, um, something that's in the public domain, a work of art in the public domain, and slap a license on it, slap a copyright notice on it. And so in that way, the work is in public domain, but it gets recopyrighted. And so this is called copyright overreach. So the issue is that works of art have two layers of copyright. That's the easiest way to think about it. They have the underlying work of art, which could be in the public domain older than 96 years. But then what happens is that the photographer of that work of art can add a layer of, co of copyright, right? So we have these two, two layers. And so for a long time, it was very difficult for art historians to use images because everyone who took a photograph of a work of art put a copyright notice on it said this is my photograph and you can't use it including museums um, and so uh, luckily there was a decision that really helps us a lot and that's really key to know about and this is the Bridgman decision I've got it down here at the bottom of this slide now Bridgman really helps us because Bridgman basically that decision said that works of art um, that are in the public domain, if you take a photograph of them, that is a straightforward photograph, and it has to be, Bridgman only um, applies to works of art that are flat, that are two dimensional. So drawings, paintings, um, prints, and things like that. If someone takes a photograph of that flat two dimensional work of art, um, they, and it's a, a straightforward documentary photograph, they can't actually copyright that. They can't copyright it because it's a document and there's no creativity involved. This was the Bridgman decision. And so um, that doesn't apply though to sculptures. So if someone takes a photograph of a sculpture, 
they can copyright that sculpture and Bridgman, that photograph of the sculpture and Bridgman wouldn't apply. So let me walk you through some examples of that because this is, this is really key. Understanding copyright overreach is really key. So here's a screenshot of uh, David's Oath of the Horatia in the Louvre. And you can see on the lower left that there's a copyright, really prominent copyright notice that would immediately make me worried about using this image and getting in trouble in some way. Um, even though the David from the late 18th century is obviously a painting that's in the public domain. So can I use this? Can I, can I download this image from the Louvre or do a screenshot and, and use it? Um, and the, the trick is to, um, first of all, to know that you could use it under Bridgman, but also to always read the fine print. So in this case, if you click conditions for use of images, and this is very tricky, the fine print says actually non-commercial use is okay. And so this is fine for teaching and learning and scholarship. And um, uh, however, this would also be covered by Bridgman. So it's important to read the fine print because more and more museums and cultural institutions are putting up notices that say, um, that sort of distinguish between commercial and non-commercial use. So that if you wanna use an image commercially, you have to pay the museum for it, which is fair. Um, but if you wanna use it for non-commercial purposes, you can without asking permission and without paying a fee. Um, so that's more and more happening, but it's not universally the case. So here's another example. This one is from the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. Here's a Turner watercolor. Um, can you use this? Yes, under Bridgman, it's a flat work of art. You can use it, it's in the public domain. But the trick is for uh, many art historians um, that you may be, you may have need to have a really good relationship with the Ashmolean. Maybe you're using an archive there. And so in order to protect that relationship, you may not. But legally speaking, um, you, you can under Bridgman. And I should um, make clear that I'm talking about US law here. And um, uh, so under Bridgman, you can use this. Here's um, an example from Flickr. So it's not just institutions like museums that do copyright overreach. Here's someone um, on Flickr who is, has put up their photograph of David's Oath of the Horatii. And in this case, they put uh, all rights reserved on it, license on it. So this might be the best photograph you could find of the David on the web, but you, you feel like you can't use it because it's got this all rights reserved. Again, you can use it because of Bridgman. Now, the thing with Flickr is that when you upload photos to Flickr, the default uh, is that, um, uh, is this all rights reserved. And a lot of people don't know that they can go in and change the license um, and, and, and allow use. And so if you see this, it doesn't necessarily mean someone is really, you know, uh, declaring that this is their photograph and no one else can use it. It's just sort of how things get uploaded to Flickr in many cases. And I just want to show you another use case here, which is another uh, image that I found on Flickr actually for a, a smart history video I was making a few years, a few couple of weeks ago. And um, this was the most beautiful photograph I could find of this sculpture. And unfortunately, it says all rights reserved. So can I use this under Bridgman? No. So this is a copyrighted photograph. And in order to use it, because it's a sculpture, it's 3D, I need to uh, ask permission. So I just used Flickr mail and I sent an email to Eddie and said, hey, Eddie, I want to use this beautiful photograph you have on Flickr. It's, um, I'm going to use it for non-commercial purposes and I'm happy to credit you in any way that you want or put anything, any kind of restrictions on the use of the image that you want. And he wrote back and said, sure, I'm happy to. And I would say 98% of the time, or even more, 99% or 100% of the time, people will let you use their images for non-commercial use if you just ask. And we've had really good luck on Flickr. I would say 75% of the time, I, I hear within a day or two. So the moral of this part of the talk is to know your rights because you'll encounter images that have 
a copyright notice on them in lots of places. Um, and you'll also, if, for example, if you do an advanced Google image search, you'll see and you say, you know, just show me works that are available uh, for, uh, for reuse, which you can do in a Google advanced image search. And things will come up and, you know, not everything that's actually usable will come up because people don't actually post the allowable uses with their images. And so everything is sort of a little bit of a, a balancing act and, and figuring out what, what you can use. And the other thing to be careful of is that, you know, if you go to publish a scholarly article, the publisher may say to you, hey, I know that the photo, the work of art you want to use is in the public domain and you took the photograph. So you own the copyright of that of that photograph, if it's a sculpture, for example. Um, but even so, we want you to get permission from the museum and therefore you may have to pay a reproduction fee. So legally you can use it, but publishers demand uh, kind of rights clearances that they don't need to demand. So our advice is to push back and try to educate people about what we can and can't use. I mean, the problem with all of this is that um, for art historians, when digital images happened, when the web happened, there were uh, so many restrictions placed on images. You know, if you if you clicked, you know, what are the terms of use for me to use this image? You would sometimes get like three pages to scroll through of legal language, and it was just terrifying to think, you know, well, if I don't, if I use this and I'm not allowed, what will happen? And so there was a real chilling effect in the discipline. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that in a way art history comes late to, um, to the digital humanities because of all of these restrictions that are so nervous making um, around images. So now let's talk about how to use something that really is in copyright, not just copyright overuse, but really in copyright. So there are three possibilities. One obviously is to get permission from the rights holder. That's pretty straightforward. Um, the next possibility is to check to see whether there's a license. Um, sometimes, uh, most often the kind of license people use is a Creative Commons license. So if there's a license, that means that the copyright holder has said, you're allowed to use this. And we'll talk about that in, in specific ways. And number three is to rely on fair use. So let's start with Creative Commons. So a Creative Commons license basically says, you can use this, but you can only use it in the following ways. So the examples, I'll show you an example from Smart History, but Creative Commons licenses aren't just good to use, uh, good for knowing what you can use that's already out on the web. They're also really good for you to apply to your own work that you put online that protects it, that makes sure that people attribute it and use it in the way that you want it to be used. So Smart History uses a Creative Commons license. And you can see if you go to our Flickr group, it's right down on the lower right, it says some rights reserved. So it doesn't mean that we've released this into the public domain for anyone to use however they want, that, but that we've restricted the rights. But it means that no one has to ask us because the license is right there. And Smart History's license allows for use as long as you attribute you know, you say you got this from Smart History, you link back. Um, we allow non-commercial use, um, not commercial use. And we ask that anyone who uses our images shares them in the same way with the same license. So those are Im important restrictions um, to pay attention to when you're using uh, a Creative Commons license. Now, people use different versions. Some people only require attribution, some people, allow commercial use. So it, you know, it really varies, but you can always click through and see what's allowed with a Creative Commons license. So what if there's no license or there are no guidelines about what you're allowed to do? What do you do then? Well, you can rely on fair use. And the best publication uh, to consult for this is the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use that CAA put out a few years ago because there are very specific use cases listed there and you can find your use case and read that over and make sure that you're covered by fair use. So um, in this case too, you don't have to ask the person who holds the copyright if you can use it because your use is 
fair use. And, uh, you know, you should go consult those use cases and the guidelines and the CA guidelines. But basically, there are two uh, key issues. One is, and this is really the big one, this is the big important one. One is that, um, that you have to transform it in some way. You can't just put it up and leave it there and, and, and not change it in some way. So you have to transform it by adding learning content around it, by putting it in a video, um, by you know the various ways of transforming it, but it has to be a different kind of, of use. And the other thing is to use it in proportion. So for example, if I was gonna use some a, a piece of a video and I really only I'm talking about the first 30 seconds of a video, I shouldn't post the whole video. So, you know, fair use is, is really a wonderful thing and we should take a lot more advantage of it. Um, and I actually just, we really wanted to keep these to 30 minutes. So I wanted to get to not just what can you use, but how to find images, how to find great high resolution, beautiful images that you can use in teaching and in, in scholarship. And I've listed some of our favorite sources here, uh, but in the handout that we're gonna make available, the Google Doc, there are many, many more. Um, it's, it's important to know that when you're on Flickr or you're on uh, doing a Google image search that you can do an advanced search and just search for images with a Creative Commons license. Another really handy trick is Google Arts and Culture, which has really beautiful high resolution images, but they're not downloadable from uh, Google Arts and Culture. But Wikimedia went through uh, Google Arts and Culture and scraped those images and they're on Wikimedia. So if you actually just search artist and title and Google Arts and Culture and then the word Wikimedia, you'll find that high resolution on, on Wikimedia. Um, so you may know of some of these great sources already, but many more, as I said, are listed in the handout. Strategies, use Google image search only as a starting point. Basically every, you know, so many archives and libraries are not, don't show up in a Google image search. I use Google reverse image searches a lot. So sometimes I'll find something low resolution and I wanna find other versions of it. And so I'll do a Google image search or reverse image search. I use Google books a lot to find additional metadata. So say I find something online, I'm like, wow, that would be perfect to illustrate this idea that I'm talking about. But the only thing that I find is, you know, there's, it's on Pinterest, right? It has no real caption information that I can rely on, but I can actually look in Google books or do a reverse image search, find more caption information, find more met metadata, and then enable more searches. So spending a lot of time searching in different ways, very much like just doing research. Um, check state and local archives. They're a wealth of um, content. Um, so uh, those are my basic strategies and sources. I think the main moral is not to be satisfied. You know, find an image, but spend, spend an hour looking for another one. I will tell you that 90% of the time, if I spend an hour or two looking, and I know that sounds like a lot, but it really yields a much more beautiful image with more reliable caption information often. Um, and uh, it's just really worth the time to do that. So um, I just wanna end by reminding everybody that we have these upcoming workshops and, uh, and we can continue the conversation in Facebook. And I'm happy to, answer any questions. Maybe I, did I go too long? Did I, do we have time? Okay. We, do. we have nine minutes for, for questions. That's great. And um, I'm popping on now that we're here to help with the q and I'm Lauren Kilroy Eubank. I'm the new Dean of Content and Strategy here at Smart History. And uh, just to encourage people, if you do have questions right now, just to pop them in the Q&A. And it looks like we have some. Um, and great. so, so Beth, if you wanted to, I think the first question we got is, what about images on JSTOR? Yeah. Or, sorry, art, art store, art store, art not JSTOR, art store. Yeah, well, art store, art store, you know, 
thank God for Art Store in the beginning, right? Art Store made all these images available to us um, when there weren't high quality digital images out there yet. Um, they charged money for them, but our institutions paid for them and we had access to them. Of course, Art Store does download, you know, you are allowed to download from Art Store and they will tell you what you can do and not do. But basically it's the same thing. It's, it's if a work of art is in the public domain, it's flat and um, and uh, the photograph that you're using of it, the image that you're using of it is documentary. You can use that image however you like. It's covered by Bridgman and Bridgman is accepted by CAA. It's accepted by the Art Dealers Association of America, the AAMD Art Association of Art Museum Directors. And so you can rely on Bridgman in that case. But if, if it's a work of art that's still under copyright, then you're, you're still gonna have this, basically the same issues no matter where you get the image from. Um, we have another question um, about a scholarly publication. Does an academic journal or a university press book count as non-commercial? Yeah, that's the big, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> and we knew we were gonna get that question because it's the best question. Um, and non-commercial use is complicated um, and in the handout that we're gonna um, distribute and make available, we have the, a link to describing this, the fuzziness of commercial and non-commercial use. It's very fuzzy, it's fuzzy in the law. There's no strict line there. Um, for example, if Smart, Smart History is a not-for-profit, does that mean that however we use images, it's non-commercial? It's, it's complicated, but basically if, if the purpose is to make money, then the use is, is commercial. But you should go and look at, uh, we'll, we'll make that available and you can go read a sort of longer discussion of that. And we have a couple of questions that I think overlap and uh, so I'll just give a couple of examples. We have some who are asking really great questions about what counts as two-dimensional. So there's one question uh, of, does a photograph of a book or a manuscript count as two-dimensional or say a photograph of a bas-relief, does that count as two-dimensional or yeah. a photograph of a Greek vase, of a painting on a Greek vase, does that count as two-dimensional? Yeah, basically two-dimensional means really two-dimensional to be really strict about it. I, I have to admit there's sometimes I've wanted to stretch that to include relief sculpture and things like that. But strictly speaking, if there are different points of view, you know, if you can move your head and see the light in a different way or see the sculpture in a different way, uh, then it's not covered by Bridgman, strictly speaking. And does that count also for manuscripts? As long as the manuscript is, is a, you know, manuscript illumination and it's flat. Yeah, I think that's, that, that counts under Bridgman. Okay. And let's see, um, we have a question about Google Books. If we want to expand on what that is, some people don't know. Sure. What oh yeah, Google Books is, uh, uh, Google Books and Google Scholar, uh, both incredibly helpful because sometimes I'll be, you know, I think it's just books.google.com. Um, but also if you're in a regular Google image search, a Google, if you're in a regular Google search, um, there's that little more button and you can specifically search just in books. And I do that all the time because so often images turn up in searches that I think are, will be great to, to use, but they're from really unreliable places. And at Smart History, which we, we're very, very careful about the images that we use and the caption information. And we want to be as responsible as we can with the images. And so um, what I'll do is I'll actually search Google Books to find um, some reliable uh, caption information. That, you know, so if I find a scholarly book, I know, oh, this is caption information that I can trust. And that in turn can help me do better searches. So we have a question about why is there such a distinction between 2D and 3D and the work is a form of art. So why is there this distinction in Bridgman? Yeah, guess. it's very annoying. Um, the, the idea is that when something is three, I mean, the idea of Bridgman, right? We're talking specifically about Bridgman here. The idea behind that decision is that as soon as it's three dimensional, there is an element of creativity in the photograph, right? So even if it's a Renaissance relief sculpture, 
you know, and it's clearly in the public domain, the photographer can be a little bit to the right, can be a little bit to the left, can look up, can look down, and all of a sudden there's the, the photographer can claim an element of creativity. And as soon as that element of creativity is involved, then that photograph can be copyrighted. The underlying work of art is still in the public domain, but the photograph can still be um, copyrighted because there's creativity involved. This is why it's all important for us to share images and to license them, right? To say, you know, I took this, but I'm, I want scholars to be able to use it and make, you know, make what's possible to use in, 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 in different kinds of uses available um, really, really clearly. So that, you know, sometimes it's, it's very annoying because you'll have a relief sculpture and it feels like a really straight on image of a relief sculpture. Um, but because it's 3D, strictly speaking, it's not covered. I hope that answered that question. So here's an interesting question is we yeah. have, and we have time for a couple more. Right. Um, is uh, what about a book cover with the work of art on the, of the work of work of art, a photograph of a work of art on the book cover, something like the demos <laughs> of Is that fair use? Is that covered under infringement? I, I, I need to be checked on this, but I'm pretty sure book covers are not copyrightable. Yeah, yeah this is a good question. It um, is a very tricky question. Yeah, <laughs> I love all these questions. It's, it's, um, really, it's really, really tricky. And it's no wonder that we've all been, you know, reluctant to, to you know, breach this digital barrier. And we have a question about teaching educational use. So is there a difference for educational use? Say you use a Flickr image that has some rights reserved in a PowerPoint for class. Do you have to credit that in the PowerPoint that the person who copyrighted it? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's always good practice to to have full caption information if it's if it's a flat work and it's just a documentary photo i don't then there's no need to do that but um otherwise probably yes and it's especially obviously when the creative commons license says um you must attribute it obviously then then we attribute it i hope i answered and that i think one. our our we have time for this final question. And if we don't get to your questions, please, we'll either address them in the Facebook or, or you can find us there and we're happy to answer more. But I think for our final question uh, is about how does Bridgman work in the international copyright domain? Oh, don't ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, some countries uh, basically are adhering to Bridgman-like um, uh, rules and regulations and others are not. Um, so it really depends on the country. Um, in Italy, they recently basically said, you know, cultural objects can be used for non-commercial use, uh, you know, as long as they're in the public domain. Um, so, um, you know, photographs can be used. So, uh, you know, it's it's complicated in the internet. And I'm not a lawyer, as I said, and smart, you know, where this is not this is not legal, strictly legal advice. Um, so I think you have to, uh, if you live in another country and use the images there, then you'd have to do some research into those regulations. Okay. Well, I think that is the, the end of our webinar for today. I want to answer one more question. Okay. Um, is Flickr the best way to share art images with others? I would say right now, yes. Um, I wish there was another way, but right now it's the best way for us to share images with one another. Um, and so if you go somewhere and take pictures, put them up on Flickr, allow non-commercial use, um, and then we can begin to share our images with one another even more than we do. I'm done. Yeah, so um, we have another webinar next week if anyone would like to join us about how to make images beautiful that will deal with some really basic tips on Photoshop. And if you have more questions, like we said, please reach out to us on Facebook or if you are, don't wanna be on Facebook, obviously you can find us on Twitter or you can email us and we're happy to answer more questions. Yep. And right after this webinar, we'll make the handout available both on, on Smart History and also um, on the Facebook group, the handout and this and the video and um, anything else we can share that would be helpful. Thanks everybody.